privilege of serving here as president at RVCC and the delight of welcoming you this morning to this conference. Um, when I was thinking about this conference today, two things occurred to me. Uh, number one, community colleges are always about community building. And when I think about building community, there are some real fundamental structural questions that we need to ask about how those communities get built and how we think about development and how we think about the future, not only for the students who come through our doors, but for the businesses that they build and develop um, and the world that follows on. And when I think about that, what I know is that RVCC is very lucky to have a professor like Dan Aronson who always makes sure that the important questions get put on the table. Um, and that's really reflected in the conversations that will take place this morning. So on behalf of RVCC, I'd like to thank Dan uh, for putting this conversation together, for making sure that um, our community college is a place where we can convene around important issues about the future of our lives together um, and where students can really be brought to the table to think through um, those issues in community that they'll be responsible for leading us with in the future. Um, so Dan, thank you. Um, welcome to all uh, and I hope your conversations are productive and insightful. Thank you. President Crable, thank you. And before you leave the college, because she is leaving us to go to another college in the near future, I want to state publicly that no matter how delicate the topic, uh, President Crable has always given me a voice. So, thank you. <clears throat> I'd also like to thank the uh, New Jersey chapters of the Sierra Club and the American Planning Association for uh, sponsoring. Uh, I want to mention that there are some world-class presenters here who can command large fees and they offer their services uh, free of charge. We shouldn't take that uh, for granted. And I want to thank Jim Crane from uh, Ridewise for always giving me uh, access, to say the least. <clears throat> in, in 2010, Renowned scholars Andrew Hacker and Claudia Dreyfus, uh, Claudia Dreyfus published a book titled Higher Education, How Colleges Are Wasting Our Money and Failing Our Kids and What We Can Do About It. The authors skewer scores of colleges across the country and then offer their own 10 best list. Out of all the colleges in the country, RVCC made the list. Right now, I'd like to paraphrase the first three sentences the authors wrote about RVCC. As we drove up to it, we could see Raritan Valley Community College's signature feature, a sprawling parking lot large enough for a regional shopping center. That's because it's situated far from any major city and ill-served by public transportation so it's nearly 10,000 students get there in almost as many cars. The authors then move on to RVCC's academic accomplishments, never returning to the points discussed in those first three sentences. In somewhat similar fashion, academicians at colleges across the country complain about parking. And after the problem is addressed, normally by building more spaces, these academicians move on to ostensibly more weighty matters. But in fact, parking policies go to the very heart of who we are as a community and as a college. Bear with me as I make my case. Free or below cost parking is a subsidy for driving over and above all the other subsidies for driving. Such subsidies undercut the market for transit alternatives. In turn, the absence of effective transit alternatives imposes the costly burden of total automobile dependence. The main solution, it's not the only solution, but the main solution is to charge user fees for driving which would help generate low-cost transit alternatives while improving transportation by reducing congestion. 
User fees for driving could also raise revenues to fund transit alternatives. Now we get to the theme of the conference. Sufficiently convenient transit alternatives would render unnecessary portions of the oceans of parking lots surrounding us, enabling us to build on those lots. It would make most sense to start this process on parking lots near transit since there's a growing market for real estate near transit. And Mr. Gans is a builder and he's going to speak to that later. If implemented on a mass scale, and to prevent confusion, I'm going to repeat that. If implemented on a mass scale, this approach stands to improve housing affordability. Between 1930 and 1950, when a substantial amount of land was open for real estate, land prices fell, making it possible for people of modest means to buy a home. Currently, if we were to free up parking lots for building, and if we were to permit multi-story building, it could also improve housing affordability. Donald Shoup, author of The High Cost of Free Parking, observes that we could undertake the largest reclamation of land since the Dutch constructed the dikes. Notice that sufficiently high parking fees directly reduce the demand for parking at the same time that they help generate a market for transit alternatives. In that sense, raising parking fees can be especially effective in freeing up parking lots for development. <clears throat> Let's survey what we have so far. Lower cost transit alternatives and improved transportation, along with abundant, more affordable housing where a growing number of households want to be. All of this made possible by raising parking fees. That's a sweet scenario, but it gets even sweeter. Residents of neighborhoods served by transit engage in more physical activity and enjoy a reduced incidence of obesity. That's a lot of beneficial outcomes from raising parking fees. Let's contrast those sweet scenarios with the status quo. Because of the prevalence of free parking, Americans work without end to pay for cars to sit in traffic and work without end to pay for the high cost of chronic disease stemming from a sedentary lifestyle. I once concluded a newspaper column by noting that even hamsters on a treadmill get the benefit of exercise. The obvious implication is that our lives are worse than hamsters on a treadmill, which is pretty pathetic. <laughs> Phil, how much exercise did you get this morning? None. None. Patty. How much exercise did you get so far today? Raise your hand if you got exercise today. Whoa. Oh, my God. I have to change what I was about to say. <laughs> okay. And I've practiced this for months. All right. Now. <laughs> All right. What I was going to say is that um, I arrived here earlier than probably any of you. And I had no, I'm really surprised by that. I had no trouble finding time to exercise. And it's not because I'm so disciplined, it's incorporated into my routine. Every morning I've got to walk to the station. And it feels like a million dollars. That's not my unique response. Multiple studies have found that exercise significantly elevates mood among a you know, uh, um, slew of other benefits. Earlier, I stated that parking policies go to the very heart of who we are as a community 
and as a college. Consider this. Us teachers are hard working, but because of the prevalence of free parking, all of our efforts go to preparing students for lives worse than hamsters on a treadmill. And at this point, let me interject that I think all those people who raise their hands are very much the exception. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the rampant obesity problem that, that, that we do have and all the chronic disease that we do have. In any case, planners, we need you to help Americans overcome their imitation of Sisyphus. Transportation issues particularly relate to community colleges because our dual mission consists of excellence and access. But access cannot be truly meaningful without effective transit alternatives. Of course, a college cannot by itself create effective transit alternatives. It must be a community-wide effort. And since we're talking about a community-wide enterprise that involves ideas, community colleges should be directly involved. I would like to see our college work with Somerville, which has demonstrated leadership. I'm going to come to that in a minute. There's someone uh, here from uh, Montclair. I would like to see you work with Bergen County Community College, but we can always come back to that. I want to transition to a different topic. The remarkable commonality of interests between disparate parties surrounding our policy approach. The business community could benefit on several counts. For example, the recent revival of New Jersey's construction industry has been anemic. Its recovery could be accelerated if we were to enable builders to meet the growing market for real estate near transit. For further benefits, consider the case of Ventura, California. After enduring typical downtown blight, municipal officials, in consultation with the business community, raised parking fees and earmarked the revenues for downtown improvements, including more police officers. Ventura is now one of the most visited towns in all of California. And there are several municipal officials here today. Uh, I hope, you know, um, you heard that clearly. But in any case, in addition to being good for business, our policy approach would benefit the environment because of reductions in both sprawl and vehicle miles traveled. Low- and middle-income households would benefit from the abundance of housing near transit. There is even common ground between conservatives and progressives. And I want you to listen to this next sentence. Our policy scenario involves a reduction in subsidies to enable the private sector to respond to existing household preferences and values. That has conservatism written all over it. At the same time, progressives and radicals could enthusiastically endorse policies that generate transit alternatives along with, abu along with an abundance of housing near transit. And I'd love to elaborate on this point during the uh, Q&A. So there's great potential for disparate groups to benefit from our approach. This is significant because an overwhelming majority of Americans consistently state in surveys that they want their leaders to work together and compromise to solve problems. <clears throat> We've just shown, however, that on crucial issues, it's possible to work together and not have to compromise. And in just a few moments, I'm going to introduce someone from the hard-nosed world of politics whose actions validate my argument. One important point before proceeding. All of the policy measures at issue here can be implemented at the local level, which means we don't have to be at the mercy of a federal or even state bureaucracy. We are in a position to provide a model that would resonate far beyond the confines of our community. 
The final topic of my talk concerns local leadership. Consider the following. After many years of difficulty, where's Colin? Driver. Okay. He was involved with this. He's from Somerville. After many years of difficulty, Somerville municipal officials authorized the construction of multi-story, high-density buildings near transit. Additionally, they replaced a street linking the station to Main Street with a pedestrian mall. Anton Nellison, a resident of Somerset County, is a world-renowned planner who offers the concept of a high-tech flexible van service that would make possible public transit in the suburbs. Jeff Tittle, a resident of Hunterdon County, is the state's most influential environmental activist and has earned distinctions from the National Sierra Club. In 2009, RVCC signed a, memora a memorandum of understanding with the US EPA to tackle a comprehensive array of environmental issues. RVCC is the only community college in the country to have entered such an arrangement with the EPA. And while my colleague, Dr. J. Kelly, couldn't be here at this moment, he was very much involved with that. Clearly, we have an impressive group of local leaders. But there's still more. I saved the best for last. Senator Kit Bateman took time out from his busy schedule to be with us here today. Senator Bateman was the sole Republican in the state Senate who voted for a bill that would have brought New Jersey back into the regional greenhouse gas initiative. The guy took a stand for crying out loud. You, 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 you no response? All right. REGI, as it's called, is a multi-state multi initiative to promote clean energy and efficiency, including reductions in vehicle miles traveled. It might appear that Bateman's a Republican who's willing to reach across the aisle and compromise. But in fact, among the seven governors who started REGI, three were Republican, and the governor who spearheaded Reggie was George Pataki, Republican of New York. The tradition of Republican environmental leadership within New Jersey is even more impressive. So Bateman was acting as a Republican, and he offers a real-world confirmation of my argument that it's possible to work together without compromise. Now let's sum up. Our community could take steps to benefit disparate parties, providing a model that would resonate far beyond the confines of our community, and we have the local leadership to do it. That's a potent combination of factors. I would hope that you find it exciting and intriguing, but at the same time, it's worrisome. It's worrisome because we might have all this potential in our hands and fritter it away. I say that because if a proposal is made to diverge from business as usual, all holy hell breaks loose. People cling to business as usual like babies cling to their security blankets. It matters not that business as usual is worse than hamsters on a treadmill, and it matters not that business as usual is leading inexorably to environmental disaster. People don't want to listen. There's actually a scientific basis for this observation about clinging to business as usual. It's called status quo bias. Professional studies indicate that if faced with difficult decisions, people revert to the status quo. Note, however, that there have been particularly reassuring outcomes in connection with our policy approach 
and that could help us overcome the status quo bias. Planners could point to the, to the successful example of Ventura, California. The Sierra Club could point out that its advocacy of downtown development has been validated by economic reality. While office buildings along the interstates are saddled with high vacancy rates, real estate near transit has maintained its value. Somerville could point to its ability to prevail over serious obstacles, and all of us could point to the fact that we simply want to enable builders to meet the growing demand for real estate near transit. Finally, to my colleagues at RVCC, since our profession is about ideas, we should be restlessly seeking ways to surmount business as usual, for us to be encumbered by a status quo bias is tantamount to negating our very identity. It's not sufficient to tout our national distinctions. If so much can be achieved at the community level, then it's incumbent upon one of the country's most distinguished community colleges to take on even more of a leadership role. We should implement tangible, substantive measures that are practical at the same time that they serve our mission of public education. I welcome any comments or questions. I also hope that the senator could stay for just a few more minutes in case anybody has any comments or questions. I put my heart and soul into that. Uh, I figure if one of you just starts, well, actually, I wasn't looking for applause. I want, I want, I want comments or questions for crying out loud. I, I left time for that, you know. So, um. after hearing all your great discussion today, and after knowing that we have a lot of experts here who are going to be talking on the subject that you broached, I think that the culmination of all of this and something that we could all probably get behind would be some real legislation or the possibility of legislation that might help these ideas along. I, I have a direct response to that. Um, look, I assume you're talking about state legislation, right? Yes, I am. Um, and there's a role for that, obviously. But now, J Jane, are, are you still a member of a council in your town? No, um, uh, but I'm on the Open Space Committee. And you served as a council, council member for how many years? Five. Five years. All right. The reason I mention that is parking policies are almost entirely municipal. So while, uh, so while I don't dismiss your point about state legislation at all, and I could even uh, mention some ideas which I don't think are too terribly provocative that the state, legisl state legislature could do, I think most of this really has to be done at the municipal level because these are parking policies. You see what I'm saying? Well, I think also that um, this particular organization, which is sponsoring this meeting today, the planners, um, had their meeting of um, municipal officials in November um, at the League of Municipalities. And I think that uh, one of the things that should probably come out, because many of the recommendations that are made at that particular meeting suddenly appear in our municipal land use laws. Uh -huh. So maybe that might be okay. a way to launch into some of the projects that would work for communities that are interested. Well, there are at least a handful of professional planners here. Would you raise your hand? Okay, so you heard what Jane uh, just uh, mentioned. Um, thank you, Jane. Now that you started us off, oh, Jan had his uh, hand up before. Uh, Jan, can you speak up without the mic, or you think you need? I want everybody to hear you. Um, you know what? I recall you're mentioning gentrification. Uh, Jan is a student, and I gave a presentation here uh, about this topic, and a couple of students, to my surprise, um, expressed concern about the problem of gentrification. Look, where is John here? He's going to speak, he was going to speak to this. He, he's just 
got his PhD from Blaustein. I don't know what happened. Uh, okay. Um, look, this can happen, right? Um, if there's a growing market for real estate near transit, the uh, buildings that have been constructed near transit command a premium. So it could price out low-income households. That's why early in my talk, I emphasized that the policy I'm talking about can benefit low- and middle-income households if implemented on a mass scale. I don't have an immediate response to, to what you're saying currently, all right? Uh, it is a concern. Uh, by the way, Tony, sometimes you speak to this issue, don't you? Uh, I don't know if you want to make a, uh, and, and Dan has a comment, but really as, as a teacher, I'm thinking of the long run and I'm, and, and I'm thinking of the effects of, of, of opening up parking lots for development on a mass scale. So you guys, please speak up. I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, but you know, my philosophy has always been, you know, almost parallel. But it said, listen, if you've got 100 low and moderate income people in an area that you're going to develop, let's say, let's assume you want to keep that. Well, the typical New Jersey rule for a long time has been 20%. So if you've got 100 people there, you need to build 500 units to balance those folks back out. Now, sociologists and psychologists have been telling us over and over and over again, if you go beyond a 20% number of low or moderate income people in a context of a neighborhood, things begin to happen which are not positive to those neighborhoods. Once you get to neighborhoods with their 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100% low income, you go look at places like Camden, you look at North Philly, where it is a complete concentration of poverty. So the key in some respects is for the municipalities to get off of their dime and say, if we're really going to do this, then let us build the densities that are needed and necessary to balance the equation. And that, I think, has really been one of the key issues because the majority of, and I will talk to this much, much uh, later in my presentation, I think that there is a certain limitation on height and character that an older generation wants to see that the new generation doesn't really care about at all anymore. <laughs> and I think this is a generational issue which is going to affect politics in the next few years, no doubt about that. And I think what the millennials want to see is very different than what the baby boomers want to see. But the law says 20% low against 80% other. And I think the key is to allow that balance to occur in a kind of a reasonable and a really beautifully well-designed way. And there's no reason why that can't happen. And people begin to say, well, if you do all beautiful design, it's going to push the price up and everybody's going to be out of it. Well, if you're a developer, you understand the argument is between 12% low and moderate and 20%. Some of the developers say we can't afford the 20, but we can certainly afford the 12. Well, if it's 12, then the number of market rates you have to build simply goes up. So this is really an equation I think could be very easily balanced, and if that is balanced next to transit, and in a walking environment, and de to close to decent schools, and close to open space, it's the best of all possible worlds. And there is no doubt, and you'll see this later in my presentation, if you just take the 251 train stations in the state of New Jersey, we can, we can completely house all the projected growth for New Jersey for the next 150 years, no, going no further than five minutes away from existing train stations. Which means we could get further development without sprawl. There would be no need for an additional square inch of farmland to be occupied in this state ever again. <laughs> Uh, somebody back there raised his hand. Uh, yes. Is that Joe? Yeah, it's, um, it's Joe. Um, you mentioned before about the uh, flexible uh, maintenance service. Um, and I think that's a really good point. Um, I think that there's a lot of uh, Have there been any um, feasibility studies conducted in terms oh. of the use or uh, profitability, or are you taking more of a um, if you build it, they will come approach? I, I, look, I can actually say a couple of things about that, even though this is your thing. Tony, you don't mind if I. Um, look. Uh, put aside feasibility for a moment, although I'll come back to that. You know, for years I've been uh, telling my students about this unique idea, and then two and a half years ago I traveled to Yale University to actually experience it. Oh, it's a um, flexible van service. It uses GPS and software that instantaneously calculates optimal routes. 
Uh, the point is there's no fixed route, so you could actually have effective public transit in the suburbs. So it's up and running at, at Yale University. I'll, I'll say something uh, uh, more about that when I introduce Tony later. But um, the students uh, love it. Now, look, when you say feasibility, and, and whether you essentially were asking if there's a market for it, right? Um, uh, Jim, do I have, uh, you know, two, three, four minutes? I don't know how we're doing with time. Okay. Um, th thank you for that question, Joe. Let me repeat that with all the subsidies for driving, it's difficult to get a market for uh, public transit. But let's say for argument's sake that you know, we're, we're obviously not going to eliminate all the subsidies for driving overnight. So there's some uh, measures we can take right now that would help create a market for trans any transit alternative, including the flexible van service. We could authorize drivers of public transit vehicles, including vans, to utilize devices that make uh, red lights go green. Now, uh, currently, uh, the current law restricts usage of those devices to drivers of emergency vehicles. And I talked to a legislative aide to Assemblywoman S uh, Stender, who sponsored that particular bill uh, that restricts usage of the devices, and, and I, you know, I asked him what was going on. Why did, why did you prevent drivers of public transit vehicles from using these devices? And he, and, and he said, well, we were concerned about uh, uh, problems with synchronization and creating uh, a traffic congestion that way. I wrote in a newspaper column that this completely misses the point. Drivers should want to increase the market for transit alternatives so drivers will have a less congested ride. Um, I should just add this. I talked to a couple of vendors of these devices. There is a hierarchy so that if you're a driver of an uh, emergency vehicle, you can trump the bus that's coming the other way. You, you understand what I'm, I'm saying? So that should not be an issue. Um, all right, so if we change that law, that would increase the market for transit alternatives. Uh, oh, um, Jim mentioned this to me earlier. We should promote pay-as-you-drive auto insurance. It's good for uh, uh, some drivers, and it's good for the insurance companies. If there is, if if people could um, reduce their premiums by driving fewer market, uh, fewer miles, and that would create a market for transit alternatives. I hope that's clear. Again, if people could reduce their premiums by driving fewer miles. Um, Insurance companies do stand to gain uh, with fewer claims, right? So this very much could be a win-win situation. And, and there's some movement. It's very, look, the insurance industry is very uh, traditional and resistant to change. But there is some movement in the insurance industry for this. Um, all right, that's, that's my response to you, Joe, and thank you very much. Actually, just as one footnote, both Allstate and Progressive both are running pilot pilot programs here right. in the state already for that. Yes, thank you, Jim. Uh, is that Don? Yeah, I was uh, chairman of the Raritan Valley Group of the Sierra Club when Bridgewater was working on their, updating their master plan, and they were increasing the density in downtown Somerville. People called me up and said, we can't do that. The misconception being that increased density will turn, um, in, in Bridgewater, uh, turn Bridgewater into Camden or something like that. And they, they said, well, say, well, we want to be like uh, Brasking Ridge and have high property values. Well, I point out that Bridgewater is never going to be Brasking Ridge. And a lot of, I live on an acre of land in Martinsville, and I'm tired of mowing lawns and raking leaves. <laughs> a lot of my friends are the same thing. I would love to have a nice high rise in, in Bridgewater <laughs> that I could live in. It was close to shopping, close to libraries, had some bike lanes so I could ride to the mall, and also could get to, to downtown Somerville, you know, with a good transit, so, so I think that you don't have to just concentrate on the train stations. I think hubs surrounding the train uh -huh. stations would, and I just wondered if you thought about that. And when, I think in our conversations, I think Jim has touched on that. So Jim, if you want to take that. Um, talking about buses around hubs? And and buses. Yes. Um, Not just downtown, but other concentrated areas, say within yes. Bridgewater, something um, like this. One of the 
issues that's presently going on in the whole TDM or uh, TOD area is the issue of where to build and when. One of the big problems is that as we develop land, if the land is not developed in such a way as to allow future uh, transit, it makes it incredibly hard. And I'm thinking, you know, you can have some properties along Route 22 and everything else where it would be very difficult for a bus to get in and out of there and everything else and to actually make a uh, schedule run. But it is possible also to have, and it's actually very much needed, to actually have feeders that go into transit stations from uh, the, the surrounding area. That does several things. It frees up land at the station more, so you can actually build more there, but you also are pushing people uh, toward that. The real problem, though, is after doing this for as long as I have, the real problem is the cost. The setup costs and the operating costs of bus services is very high. That's why issues like flexible van services and things along those lines are pretty much where we're moving to because the, the cost structure is so much less, especially when you're piloting services. You don't want to go out and spend hundred dollars to, to $150,000 on a bus with a driver and, and get all that clearance for something that may not work. So uh, pioneering uh, new routes through vans and even taxi services or joint rides and stuff is, is definitely a, uh, a good way to get started. Um, I had one little comment. Did, it, uh, am I missing anybody raising their hand? No. Um, this is something modest, but I, I, it has some um, uh, level of significance. I don't see why the state, uh, and I'm not thinking of a law, it could be regulatory. I don't see why the state can't simply instruct all public employers at all levels to um, have the paperwork ready for employees to take advantage of the higher commuter choice of federal bennies. Uh, anybody familiar with that? Um, the federal government allows employers and or employees to purchase up to $230 a month in transit vouchers pre-tax. So, you, so the employer and employee save on taxes, right? Now think about it. If a couple of private employers here or there make use of this, you know, it's good for their employees. By the way, RVCC does this for me. It's, it's, it's very convenient. But it doesn't help congestion in general if just a couple of employers do this. But with public employees, we have a critical mass right there. And um, so and not only will um, public employees take transit, but it creates a, a, a market for transit, and public employees can set up uh, commercial van pools. There's certain uh, you know, bureaucratic rules. Um, but here's the, here's the two main points. Um, it will help reduce congestion for all commuters, what I just described. And second, when people start seeing all these public employees saving on repair costs, gas costs, insurance costs, maybe the cost of a second or third car, they'll start to say, hey, wait a minute. Maybe uh, all this talk about public transit and saving the environment is the precise opposite of inconvenience. And I hope everybody heard that. Um, all right, is it almost 10? Talk to me, somebody. Hello? Oh, I have a question. Where if, are um, you? Oh, hi. You started out by talking about all the parking spaces around the college. I'm wondering if the college, when it was built, ever considered uh, locating in downtown Somerville where there would have been train and bus service. I, you know, the col those decisions were made in the uh, late uh, 60s when I was uh, in junior high. So um, I, uh, I just can't uh, speak to that. Uh, but we're here and suburban sprawl exists. We, we want to contain suburban sprawl for sure, right? But the suburban sprawl exists. We're not going to do um, uh, kind of an opposite of uh, the Khmer Rouge. 
I don't know, well, you might not remember the Khmer Rouge. You're not going to ha- force everybody to move to downtown areas, right? And uh, since we have this sprawl, uh, we should um, make it work as best as, uh, as we can. And again, that's where uh, d- effective transit alternatives um, uh, become relevant. So, um, PSE&G wanted to put a major transmission line right through the middle of Doris Duke's property in Hillsborough Township. And obviously Doris Duke was not very happy about that, so she solicited a number of the legislators in the area. My dad was being one of them, and they were able to lobby PSE&G to move it to just a corner of their proper, her property. And in return, she gave the money to purchase oh. this land that we're sitting on right now for Rat Valley Community College. And you know, maybe in hindsight, you know, a Somerville might have been good, but I'm not sure that Somerville would have had appropriate land mass to house such a facility. Because as you know, the college keeps expanding and expanding. So but that's a little bit of a history. And uh, so Doris Duke was really the the individual that made it happen. So. Uh, oh, Matt. Matt, please speak up. You were talking about uh, charging user fees for driving. What would you uh, suggest municipalities use that revenue for, for a tax break, for a tax or for all the You know, ultimately, public feedback has to uh, come into that. And ultimately, municipal officials and legislators will decide how much of the user fees will go back in the form of property tax rebates and how much of the revenues from uh, user fees would be used to subsidize uh, alternative transit. Really, the population as a whole, a- a- through their legislators, have to work that out. Um, you, you are? My name is Frank Banish. I'm a- Oh, from Flemington. Professional planner. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, and uh, one of the things that we're not here to talk about, <clears throat> but that was raised, and I think you point the way in part uh, with this discussion is the suburbs need to be reformed. I initially looked at the discussion that we're here for today and I thought we were talking about replacing strip malls. And when I saw what we were talking about, I realized, as Tony always points out, that this is the essence. Get back to where we can really get transit, housing connected to transit. But here's the thing. The suburbs are full of places that, you know, a lot of us refer to it as sprawl or even more demeaning terms. And at the same time, a lot of us refer to it as home. And I think one of the things we have to realize is that there's an awful lot of housing in New Jersey that is very inefficiently used. We've gone from living five people living in 1,000 square feet when I was a kid to three people living in 7,000 square feet now. Right. So there are an awful lot of opportunities for us to go back and retrofit that housing, even though it's not so well located. Things like these re- transit alternatives that could get out to the suburbs you know, if every house that has adequate sewer and water capabilities and extra room could have an extra unit, I don't think we'd even need to deed restrict them all for low income. We'd, we'd have more supply. What we really need is an abundance of housing opportunity, and it's so much cheaper to convert my garage into my mother-in-law apartment than it is to build her something. It's interesting. So you're talking about not just um, uh, transit alternatives in the suburbs, but making good use of the existing housing stock in the suburbs. Uh, and you know, a lot of empty nesters might be interested in what you have to say, right? Um, that that's interesting. Um, I wanted to I wanted to answer. Uh, we have ten minutes. I just wanted to answer the suburban question. Uh, Jeff Tittle, um, I'm one of the panelists later, but I wanted to answer it because I think we also forget that some of our early suburbs were railroad suburbs, and they were well laid out. Um, when you look at a Cranford or, um, or Radburn up in Fairlawn, that you can have small lot one families and still be connected to transit and still have a downtown area, still have a nice shopping district. So I think you can look at it. We shouldn't, when we look at transit villages, even though there's 250 stops around the state, one size doesn't fit all. What you may want to build as a transit village in a place like Highbridge is going to be a lot different than what you're going to build in a place like Woodbridge. And I think you need to look at you know, the, the community uh, and the visioning of the community, but also looking at the resources. Because again, if you build you know, Beth, you know, um, 
metro park in the middle of the highlands next to a trout stream, that's just as wrong whether it's, you know, McMansion development. Uh, Joe, or uh, we haven't heard from Tristan. I don't know about you, but on the back of my... A little softer. Okay, go ahead. I don't know about you, but on the back of my car, it says New Jersey, the Garden State. So I kind of have to agree with what he's saying. <laughs> Mass transit, as in what you're saying, is that there's this generational thing. And coming back to his statement all the way around is, is that what benefits the next generation? Because it's not about us anymore. It's about the next generation and what they want, what's best for them. And um, in, in response to this, it's, you know, no permanent solution without a rebellion or creation of another problem can exist in this statement. And my question to you is, you know, what do you think is the right generational move that is going to benefit them and not us? You know, you know I'm glad you mentioned that because I, no one has stated yet, including myself, that a disproportionate a number of uh, those buyers who want to live near transit are millennials. And uh, it's not necessarily a majority, but it's a disproportionate number who want to live near transit. They don't want to do the suburban uh, commute. Um, and on that note, you remember toward the end of my talk, I expressed a lot of worry about the fact that it's hard to make progress because if a proposal is made to diverge from business as usual, all holy hell breaks loose. What scares me is that the new generation has the values we want them to have with regard to sustainability, with regard to preventing a, a environmental disaster, but it's so hard to translate those values into, um, into progress because you know, everybody's clinging to business as usual. So I'm glad you brought up the uh, millennials. By the way, I'll just, I'll just quickly add this. You know, Jeff talked about uh, compact suburbs like we used to have that were served by transit. And if you have that, compact suburbs, then for someone like Jan who, you know, wants plenty of open space and wants the country um, atmosphere, that's to your benefit. Um, the compact suburbs and then leaving the, the country to be rural, right? As opposed to suburban sprawl. Uh, you know, um, Todd Alexander Littman, who is a transportation expert, pointed out that parking lots are not consistent with the amenities that people want in the suburbs. When people who want to move away from the cities want green, they want quiet, they want something uh, aesthetically pleasing. Parking lots are none of those. So um, somebody, uh, who raised their hand now? And uh, is it Danielle? Danielle. I don't know how I could tell, I can hardly see it, but go ahead. Yes, um, the gentleman over there who lives near um, Phillipsburg, I would definitely have to agree with him. Um, you know, planning is a delicate balancing act. It's balancing, you know, the needs of everyone and, and, and a variety of issues. The question that I would like to ask is, how do you balance privacy with new urban development and public transit stations? I mean, there's people out there, I mean, they don't want to live near a bus station, right. train station, it's noise, or having their neighbor be, you know, right next to them like right. in Manhattan. Because I know in Europe they have dense development and then open space where there's like nobody living there. Um, Dan, you, you seem to react to that. You want to comment? There should be opportunities for everybody to live where they want. And uh, there's definitely the population in this country since 1967, I think, has uh, doubled. Uh, and so people say, where's, where's everybody going to live? Uh, I was asked many years ago uh, by a graduate class, how can you be a developer and an environmentalist? Uh, I'm an urban developer. I believe that uh, we need to create urban centers that are successful. Uh, and by doing that, uh, we won't crowd everybody into all the other open spaces. Uh, and there should be, however anybody wants to live, there should be opportunities for those people to live. Uh, I do, as I said before, believe that uh, 
urban living living is more environmentally sound. Uh, we use less energy than our counterparts in the suburbs and uh, drive a lot less with cars. Uh, so all those things are benefits in the world to come. Uh, and at the same time, if you want to live in a house and you know, uh, do what needs to be done environmentally to live in a private house, you should be able to do that. Um, Dan didn't mention this, but I heard his business partner speak, and I believe your uh, uh, building company is very much involved with energy efficient building. Yeah, so um, who's raising their hand there? Uh, I think, Dan, you're right. You should. There should be multiple options for where, what kind of environments people want to live in, but you have to accept that there are trade-offs, and you have to accept that transit and low-density suburban living are fundamentally at odds. You can't have everything. If you want to live near transit, you're probably going to have to share that space with a lot of other people, because a lot of other people want to live near transit, too, and it's a scarce resource. So you're not going to have your acre lot within a quarter mile of the transit station because there are too many other people that want to be there. So you really have to choose one or the other. And buyers are making that choice, and they're right, aware yeah, of the, the choice. The market is speaking. The market is showing you that. Exactly. Um, well, I don't... Uh, look, the, the, the buyer has to make the trade-off. If, if they want their own personal space, but they also want to be near transit, they'll, they'll, they'll probably have to sacrifice some of that space, right? But uh, I don't see it a, a big policy problem. Um, like I said before, the status quo is truly inconvenient, right? So if, if you move away from inconvenience, I don't see that as a trade-off um, at all. Um, again, I acknowledge that there are trade-offs, but on a personal level for the buyer. And there are Look, anytime you buy something, there's, there's, there's decisions you have to go through. But they're quite aware of that trade-off. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I think the, the problem is... Uh, oh, okay. Look, look. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Look, what is expensive is the status quo. It's, um, uh, it's certainly expensive for households that we subsidize driving, we subsidize uh, parking, uh, so it creates that burden of total automobile dependence. It's very costly. Now, let me be a little bit more specific. When we set aside land for a parking lot, there's an opportunity cost. That's land that cannot be used for housing. It drives up the cost of housing. Uh, Dan can speak to that. Not, and not just that opportunity cost, there's something else. When we tell builders, that they have to have a certain amount of parking on their property, uh, uh, commercial or residential, it increases the cost for builders and it tends to decrease the revenues. And so I'm saying that the status quo is costly and inconvenient and to move away from that to, to have improved quality of life at lower cost, I repeat, is the very opposite of inconvenience. And we can flush this out. There'll be time for more Q&A today. Okay, and we're almost running up against another session, so this okay. will be the last question. I, I just had a couple of comments. I've gone through three or four phases of my life. I grew up on a farm in Central California and raised sheep, and I remember feeling sorry for the poor kids that lived in the city and didn't have all the stuff we had to, to play with on the farm. I got hired by the phone company, and they transferred me to, to the San Francisco office, and people, my older friends said, oh, you don't want to go to San Francisco because it's a terrible place to live, and you're going to have to commute. I was a single guy, just out of college. San Francisco was a great place, loved it. I came back to New Jersey, had a kid, got a house, and it was great to have a nice house with a yard. We could have birthday parties and play soccer on the lawn. Now I'm an empty nester, and I'm tired of, I, the last time I put my hammock up and sat down and had a beer in my yard was five years ago. <laughs> I'm ready to move into, into something where I don't have to maintain a yard and, and uh, have convenience. So I see a lot of generational differences, and I'm just wondering if the, the, the demographics in the country will affect you know, what kind of housing we're doing. Yeah, I mentioned that a disproportionate number of millennials are buying near transit. I think it's also uh, some of the uh, baby boomers who are now becoming uh, empty nesters, and I believe Frank Banish, you know, uh, I spoke to that before. So look, we're we're finished with this Q we're finished with this Q and A. 
I, I, I just want to say something about your wonderful uh, uh, and probing uh, comments. You know, it, it, to prepare for these conferences is physically, mentally, and emotionally exhausting. But after that Q&A, I think I have an idea for another conference. It's going to be two nights and three days. But anyway, I, I appreciate your, your feedback and your input. <laughs>